you and I live in a world where peace has become a major issue. It's an obsession. Everywhere we turn, we need peace. And everywhere we look, we don't see much of it. In the political realm, in the personal realm, the man who wrote the letter to the Philippians had several reasons to be less than peaceful. The Apostle Paul, the author, of course, is writing from prison. He's held there in a cell because he told people about Jesus. He's close to death. Humanly speaking, he had every reason to be anxious and stressed and perhaps frightened and alone. But he, living in a situation where at any moment the roof could fall in, he's writing to Christian believers about peace midst the personal storm that he's experiencing while being held in a prison cell. How is that? How do you do that? Because Paul knew something that a lot of people don't. Peace, real peace, is a gift from Jesus. It's a gift from Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples just before his passion, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. In other words, my peace is special. The world's peace is synthetic. It's usually imposed by force. It's upheld together by fragile negotiation. The world's peace is quite fleeting. It comes one day, it leaves the next. A peace that doesn't last. Paul knew the peace of Jesus. Now I chose our text from Mark chapter 4, a familiar story because it shows how Jesus introduces his peace in a stressful situation. So listen as I read from Mark chapter four. You can follow along if you like. Familiar story. That day when evening was coming, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, he took along just as he, they took, they took him among them just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. The waves died down. It was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a well-known story. A routine trip by experienced fishermen across a familiar sea. But suddenly the experience turns into a fight for life due to unexpected winds that sends the lake into convulsions. The winds are high, the waves enormous, the boat is filling. This is a stressful circumstance in every regard. The disciples are convinced that they're going to drown. Their reaction is probably the clearest clue we have concerning the severity of things. These are seasoned fishermen. This storm is beyond their experience, beyond their equipment, beyond their expertise. And just in case you missed it, it's getting dark. Verse 1. That means no stars for direction or a dim horizon, which generally provides equilibrium. All they know is water up to their ankles, motion in the boat unspeakable, unpredictable, and a direction generally down rather than forward. The fact that they had a big day didn't help either. 
Their coping mechanisms were exhausted. They were under stress, ripe for catastrophe. I think the storm which the disciples found themselves that evening is symbolic of storms we all encounter. Don't scratch us too deeply. Just below the surface, there's a great pocket of pressure, a reservoir of anxiety and confusion and instability. It comes from living in the 21st century. The speed and cost of technology leaves many of us in a fog. I'm having difficulty understanding the commercials for many of the modern products, let alone what they're for. The violence reported in the media, the manufactured violence of the entertainment industry. And then there's the reality of violence in North Korea and Syria and the Taliban and our polarized government. To say nothing of family issues and finances and health. We're tempted by these realities to become stressed, to quit, to take out our anger and frustration on somebody, anybody. Sometimes our spouse, sometimes a child, sometimes a boss, sometimes a co-worker, sometimes the dog. That's exactly where these 12 men are that night on the lake. Defenses down, storm up, caught in a sailor's ambush. Everything out of control. Now let's ask, what can we learn from their actions and especially the actions of Jesus? Mark makes no attempt to paint a pretty picture. There is nothing to admire in the performance of these disciples. And of course, I don't think any of us would have done any better. First, they have certainly lost their purpose. They quit rowing. They ran back to the boat, the end of the boat. They should have stuck to the oars, but they didn't. Secondly, they lost their perspective. When they finally scrambled to the stern, they screamed over the spray, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? What a question. Do you care? What a question to ask Jesus. Don't you care? They lost their perspective. Began asking questions about Jesus' motives, Jesus' interests, Jesus' capacity. They lost sight of the daily display of Jesus' care and compassion and power. They forgot God's faithfulness and dependability and countless displays of his trustworthiness in their past. All they saw was the storm. Along with their loss of purpose and perspective, they lost one other thing. They lost their trust, their trust in their teacher. Every storm prevents an opportunity to trust. I'll repeat that. Every storm presents an opportunity to trust. The opportunity was there that night. They missed it. Perhaps you're in a storm. Don't miss the opportunity to trust your Lord and Savior in the midst of that storm. What was Jesus doing? Well, he was sleeping, not the sleep of escape, but rather the sleep of relaxed trust. But the disciples misread Jesus' slumber and concluded that he was disinterested or uncaring or un able to do anything or perhaps as fearful as they were. They run to the back of the boat, deserting their purpose, perspective, and trust, and they wake Jesus up. And he speaks in two directions, first to the storm and then to the disciples. He rebukes the wind and the waves, and he shouted out, quiet! He told the wind, be still. And it was, simple as that, it was. The result was complete calm like a moonlit mirror. There's something very beautiful and comforting about that display of power. Now Jesus doesn't always calm every storm. I believe he's able, 
But sometimes he chooses to ride out the storm with us. The comfortable prane ride was about to get bumpy. The voice of the captain interrupted the in-flight beverage service and asked the passengers to make sure that their seat belts were fastened. Soon the plane began to roll and pitch like a boat in a wind-whipped lake. While the rest of the passengers were doing their best to deal with the turbulence, the little girl sat through it all, reading her book. After the plane landed, she was asked why she had been able to be so calm, and she responded, my daddy's the pilot, and he promised to take me home. <laughs> Trust. Trust. Well, then Jesus speaks to the disciples. He asks them two questions. Why are you afraid? Important question. Why are you afraid? Now, he knows, of course, but he wanted them to think for a moment. Now, in the calm, it always helps to ask that question. Why am I afraid? When I ask myself that question, I usually realize rather quickly that the real issue is my doubt. I doubt God's care or compassion or capacity. To fo refocus on the real problem, my doubts, opens the way to peace. The storm was all the disciples saw. They didn't see their own ability or the ability of Jesus or their future. Fear always blinds. It always paralyzes, and Jesus wanted them to refocus. So he asks, why were you afraid? Why were you afraid? Then he asks a second question. Do you still have no faith? I sense some surprise and maybe some frustration in that question. Maybe you do too. He sees little forward progress in his disciples. He had expected it by now. He had demonstrated time and again. Jesus had demonstrated his power by healing a leper in chapter 1 and a paralytic in chapter 2 and a shriveled hand in chapter 3. They should have known better. And how about us? Has God ever demonstrated love for you? Or provided for a need? Or given you peace in a storm? Or strengthened you in the face of a difficult task? Have you learned from these calmed seas? And can you face the future with confidence? Does a storm serve as an opportunity for you to trust? Incredibly, after Jesus calmed the storm, his disciples seemed just as fearful as before. They were terrified, the text says. It's one thing to face a storm. It's another thing to be in a small boat with a person who just changed the weather. <laughs> Think about that. Who is this, they ask. I think it's time for commitment for these disciples. You see, they might be following Jesus at this point because uh, they think he's an enlightening teacher. Or they like helping people. They like seeing miracles. Their association with him gives them a feeling of pride. Perhaps he's going to do something about the Romans. But Jesus is more than a moral teacher. He's more than a social reformer. He's more than a political leader. Jesus has authority. Amazing authority. Authority over everything. Jesus must be obeyed, not just admired. It is in the storms that we discover the true power and love of the Savior. It's in the storm that we discover the true power and love of the Savior. It is a storm as we yield to his authority that we discover his peace, a peace unlike the world's peace, a peace that Paul the prisoner knew, the peace that transcends all understanding. Would you, in an attitude of prayer, listen to this poem by Reverend Frank Grafe? Does Jesus care 
when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear as the daylight shades into deep night shades? Does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I'm tired and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief I find no relief, though my tears flow all the night long? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him? Does he see? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched by my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Loving, caring, powerful Father, we're so grateful for your peace, peace in the storm, peace through the storm. We give our concerns, our stresses, our anxiety to you. Take a moment and lay your burdens and cares before the Lord. Seek to learn. Take a moment. Hear us in your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves with the power of his voice. He stilled that storm. We should remember the events of the cross when Jesus was caught in another far greater storm. He could have spoken from the cross, he could have called down legions of angels, he could have come down off the cross, but he didn't. Love kept him there. While in their storm, the disciples shouted, do you care? And on his cross, he answered their question. We remember his answer at the table. Oh yes, I care. This much, this much.